Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast, where I, Celine and I, share strategies, interview retail revolutionaries, and delve into the minds of e-commerce experts to help you grow a profitable, independent retail or e-commerce business. If you're stuck in a rut, or if you feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've overachieved all of the things that you've set out to and are wondering what to do next, or how do I even make this better? I know that you're going to love today's episode. If you're stuck in a rut, feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've achieved all of the things that you set out to and are wondering what next, or how do I even make this better? Then I know that you're going to love today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. If it's your first time listening, thank you so much for joining me. And if you've been a long time listener, Can I just take this opportunity to say I am super thankful for your loyalty, for being inside of your eardrums week in, week out, and also for the messages that you guys send me on social media and in my inbox. It can get a little bit lonely when you're behind the microphone and there's no audience there to see how people are reacting. So thank you so much for tagging me on Instagram, on Facebook, for sending me emails and messages. I love it. Now, if you've been following along for the last few weeks, you'll know that here in Sydney, we are back in lockdown. Now, one of the things that I discovered in lockdown is it makes me tidy up. And I'm not a huge tidying kind of person. I've been doing a lot of decluttering. I decluttered the cupboards in my office. I decluttered my office furniture. I decluttered the tool room where we keep all of our DIY tools. And I have even been decluttering digitally. Yes. As we are moving over, we're migrating over to some new CRM software. And we've taken this opportunity to look at what works and what doesn't. What have been the most downloaded free resources that we've had? What have been the most opened emails? What kind of content do you guys love to consume? And I have to say, when you take the time to look through years and years of content and digital stuff, it's interesting to see what actually makes your customers tick or what makes your listeners tick, what makes you guys tick. And there are a few surprises, but we took took this opportunity to also have a little bit of a fun game and Elizabeth jumped in to see which was the most listened to podcast episode. The podcast has been around for a few years now. I think we're going on four, maybe five years. So over 400 episodes, which means a lot of guests. So if you've been listening for a long time, I wonder if you can pick which episode has been the most downloaded. Out of all the guests that we've had, and we've had some really famous names out of all of the areas that we've covered, money, sales, customers, marketing, impact, growth, so many things, leadership, success, we've covered pretty much every topic there is, mental health, physical health, everything. So what do you think was the most listened to episode? I'm about to reveal it. Yep. It's actually one from right back at the beginning. It was a before they were famous kind of moment. These days, Vanessa Van Edwards is the lead investigator at Science of People, but she's also a best-selling author. Her book, Captivate, The Science of Succeeding with People, has been translated into 15 different languages and more than 30 million people watch her on YouTube. Now, I have always been a behavioral science nerd. Now, I know nothing in terms of the clinical part of it, but I love being a pop psychologist when it comes to behavioral psychology, understanding not only why and how we do the things we do, but also being able to interpret what other people are telling us through. And I did manage to snag this interview a few years ago. These days, Vanessa is so popular. She works with companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Penguin Random House, you know, companies that you've never heard of before. Okay, so today's episode is going to focus on bricks and mortar stores. But even if you are pure play online, I would love for you to listen to this episode and get some really good takeaways. One of the things that I thought of straight away was how are you being mindful 
of fraudulent transactions in your business? What are actions that flag your suspicions? Now, obviously, there are the most obvious ones like Shopify flagging that it could be a fraudulent transaction. But are there other things that you look for to see whether a sale is genuine? And so in today's episode, Vanessa Van Edwards is going to teach you how to spot a shoplifter. Yep, this is the most downloaded episode. And I'll also say that I haven't listened to it for a while. And so I'm not sure how my interview skills are going. But remember, be kind, because I did record this when I was first starting out as a podcast guest. And I was super excited to have someone like Vanessa on the show. Now, we talk a lot about who we want our customers to be and who we, who they are, but one of the things you can take away from this episode is be how to be really, really clear on who you don't want as a customer. And obviously, that's those people who are going to take you for a ride. So regardless if you are pure play e-commerce or you have a bricks and mortar store or you have both, the fact is the numbers don't lie. This episode seriously rocks. And I think you should take the time out to listen to it. Oh, and I just had a thought. If you would like me to find a guest who can talk about online fraud or maybe online scams, I'd love you to jump over to my Instagram or Facebook page. You'll find me at the Selena Knight and let me know, is that the kind of thing that you would love to listen to? Drop me a DM or post a comment on this episode and let me know. Alrighty, let's jump into this episode the most downloaded episode on the Bringing Business to Retail podcast, How to Spot a Shoplifter with Vanessa Van Edwards from The Science of People. Welcome back to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. I'm super excited to announce today's guest, Vanessa Van Edwards. She is a behavioral investigator and a published author. And it's really strange. I, it's, I think it's really hard to put words on what she does, but she figures out the science of what makes people tick at her human human behavior research lab, The Science of People. Now, I urge you when, you when we finish the podcast to jump on over to scienceofpeople.com because there's loads of fun things on there and there's loads of information. But I've asked Vanessa on because I've heard her speak a couple of times and each time that she's been talking, it's usually about business, the ones that I've been listening to, I've thought, oh, I would love if I if I could speak to her about how this works in retail and she's agreed to come on the show. So welcome, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Tell us a little bit more about what you do. Sure. So you you got it exactly. We we study the hidden forces that drive human behavior. So I run a, a really cool lab and we bring people into our lab and we try to figure out what makes them tick. So personality science, body language, um, lie detection, the psychology of charisma, all of those topics that just are hard to study, but I feel like if we knew a little bit more about ourselves, we'd be able to leverage our behavior. And some people are just good at it. Like the first person who comes to mind is Richard Branson. Yes. Like really, if you look at all of the struggles that he's been through and he really is just a geeky guy, but he's just got something, hasn't he? Like he's the first person who pops into my mind when you think of charisma. Agreed. And you know, it's, it's, that's a fun game to play. So anyone who's listening, think about the person who pops into your mind when you think about charisma, because we all have that person, whether they're famous like Richard Branson or there's someone in our life. And with Richard Branson, I think what you said is absolutely true, that he's actually this geeky guy. I think either from a very young age, and I've read a couple of his, of his books, so I think it was from a young age, or at one point he decided, you know what? I'm just going to own it. I'm going to own that I'm geeky. I'm going to own that I have these weird interests. And I'm going to own that not everyone's going to like me. And the weird thing is, is that actually made more people like him. So, I, Sorry, I get the feeling, and I, I don't know if I've read this or if I've just assumed this, but he's actually quite an introvert, despite the fact that he's very full on and out there. Yeah. He, he is an introvert. <laughs> Yeah, you know, let's actually let's talk about that. So, and I think that this this will also um, help people understand how others work, which is that we talk about introverts and extroverts. And for a long time, everyone's like, "Oh, you must be an extrovert." And I'm like, "I don't know. Like that category just doesn't seem to fit me." Like, yes, there are certain situations where I feel extroverted. And then I started researching personality science and realized there's actually a third category, and that's called ambivert. And so, basically, what they've found is that 
the majority of people, over 80% of people actually fall in this middle category where you have situational introversion and contextual extroversion. So basically in certain places around certain people, you feel cheerful and outgoing and you love talking to the people you're with. And in other situations, you feel like you just would rather be alone. You don't really want to reach out to people. And so I think that what's really interesting to understand is I think that Richard Branson has leveraged his AMBA version in a way that works for him. So he knows where he thrives and he knows where he survives. And that's, I think, what makes him so charismatic. So he's just I guess he's just kind of nailed it. He's worked out what works for him and what doesn't. And and like you said, just owned it. Yeah. Like one of the things that we talk about in um, our course, our people skills course, and this is learned from very successful people, is very successful people like Richard Branson, they sort of know the places where they have to survive. So for me, for example, I am not a nightclub person. Like anywhere where it's so loud I can't hear myself think, for me, I feel like I'm barely surviving. Like I want to crawl into a hole. I like hang out by the bathroom just so I can have an excuse to go in. Like it's horrible. I'm like the most, you know, (laughs) just awkward, uncomfortable person. Whereas like in learning situations like conferences, like classrooms, like networking events, I just, I love it. I want to talk to everyone. I want to be networking at every single break. You know, I don't want to go home at the end of the night. And so it's about figuring out where those places are for you. Because if you're trying to be outgoing and charismatic in a place that you're just not comfortable, it's impossible. People are going to pick up on those on those cues. And so it's trying to figure out, and, and I'm sure in your head, think about where are the three places that you thrive, that you just feel like you are your best self, and where are the three places where you just feel like you want to crawl inside yourself and disappear. Those are your survive places. And if you can build your schedule in your life around honoring the places that you really love, that is a happy making experience. Oh, that's great. Uh, I, as soon as you said the thing about the noise, I thought of my husband who he he's a salesperson and just quickly digressing. He even though he has to have lots of meetings in coffee shops, the noise of the people talking in the tiled floors and the coffee shops just drives him insane <laughs> and he becomes the most horrible person in the world. So. Oh, I, f- I understand that. I totally understand. And you know what's funny is some people, they thrive in nightclubs because they feel like they don't have to talk. So I was talking to someone who thrives in nightclubs. She just loves like disappearing into the music. That's what she said. And I, and I started giggling and I was like, wow, like we could not think more differently about that loud music. <laughs> but that's why we love people is that there are things that make us fundamentally the same in that we all have places where we thrive and survive. But there are also things that make us fundamentally different and that those places are different. I think that's just amazing. It is. And I have a question and I kind of have two questions based on that. So the question I was going to ask you, sort of following on from Charisma, is why are some people better salespeople than others? But now you've got it in my head that, and I think the answer is yes, can the environment that you're selling in change the way that you behave? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely, that can change it. But let's, let's focus on the one that I think um, people can use right away because it's, it's a little hard to change your sales environment unless, unless you have the flexibility to pick what part of the, the retail environment you're on. That's a little harder. But I think that there is some things that you can control. And um, the best salespeople is, are the people – who are able to master the two aspects of charisma. And we talk about charisma, that term is thrown around all the time. Really what science has found, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm a science geek, so I just, I love diving into the science. But the, what the research says is that charisma is made up of two characteristics. They are warmth and competence. And that very, very charismatic people have the perfect blend of both of those characteristics. And it's extremely important that one is not more dominant than the other. Because if you're, if you're more warm, you're seen as approachable, friendly, but not credible, but not powerful, but not knowledgeable. Not knowledgeable. If you're very, very competent, you're seen as incredibly credible and wise and knowledgeable, but you're not seen as friendly, approachable, or cooperative. So in a sales environment, it's incredibly important for salespeople to master both of these things because no matter what you're selling or who you're selling to, they have to both find you relatable and warm and approachable, but also credible, knowledgeable, and dependable. 
And so it's about those two qualities. That Those are the two things that make successful salespeople worth, uh, it's so effective. So obviously you can build your knowledge on the, on the, the products that you're selling. How do you work on the warmth? Like if you're not, typically I would think that salespeople are warm people anyway because you don't get into sales if you don't like talking to people and being passionate about something that you're selling. So is that an an inherent quality in a salesperson? And even if it is, how how do we get that balance right? How do you work out where you're going wrong? Oh yeah. So um, I sadly, I don't think that warmth is an inherent quality in a salesperson, sadly. And the thing about this is we are very inaccurate at judging our own warmth and competence. So oh, no. <laughs> think, think about, for example, like if it, like the, the, I don't know if you've ever been shopping in some of the, like the posh areas um, uh, of, uh, I think actually when I was, um, so Beverly Hills or uh, downtown Manhattan or maybe um, King Street and Sydney, like, you know, these places where have these really posh boutiques. Um, did I get that right? <laughs> did I get that one right? Uh, yeah, Pitt Street Mall is probably where all the big ones are. Okay. But I completely relate because I'm thinking of um, we went into Silicon Valley and went to the name escapes me now. But every second car is a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exa- exactly, exactly. That, those were every second car is a Tesla or a Mercedes. And by the way, the only I have a I went to school at um, Sydney Uni, so that's the only reason why I know Sydney a little okay. bit. <laughs> Um, so if you think about those places, think about the stereotypical salesperson or woman specifically, we'll get down to it, where you walk in and you're touching things and they look at you like, do you really belong here? Now, if you were to ask them, I'm pretty sure if you were to say, are you a warm and friendly salesperson? They would say, oh yes, definitely. But unfortunately, sometimes their, um, judge of you can leak across as judge, as, as a lack of warmth, as judgment. And sometimes if you don't like your job or if there's an aspect of a sales portion that you don't like, that can come across as being cold, even if you yourself are very warm. And so unfortunately, I wish I could say that that salespeople all have this warmth, but it doesn't always happen that way. So they might have it, but they might not necessarily be using it. Exactly. And so there's a couple of things that you can do with both warmth and competence. Um, the first one comes down non-verbally. We'll speak non-verbally first. And the reason yeah. I, I like to focus on verbally is because we put a lot of attention on verbal. You know, we think a lot about what we're going to say in a sales pitch. We think a lot, a lot about what we're going to um, tell a, a potential customer um, about our our words. But we very rarely think about how we want to say something. And so I want to focus on that because that is sixty to ninety percent of our communication. Sixty to ninety percent of our communication is nonverbal. And I was going to say, and that's the thing that a lot of people don't think about. They, they've they rehearsed, like you said, they've rehearsed the script or they have they know that product inside out, but they don't actually think about how they're going to present it to somebody else. Yes. And so what happens is you walk into a retail environment. And by the way, I love reading nonverbal and retail environments, both the sales people as well as other customers. For example, there is very specific body language when you uh, that um, shoplifters use before they shop. Ooh. So Ooh. Um, I love retail environments. And what I've noticed is the... So the salespeople who come across as not warm will often have their words so scripted and so memorized that they lack any emotionality. So they'll say, welcome to the store. How can I help you? <laughs> Would you like fries with that? Right. So welcome to the store. How can I help you? Is very warm verbally. Verbally, that sounds very warm. Welcome. How can I help you? However, the way that it was said, and you can't even see my body right now, you know that I've said that a million times. I don't feel that welcoming. Or maybe I do, but it just I've said it a thousand times, so I don't think about it. So what I want um, people to think about, especially in retail environments, is you might have said something a million times, but this person, this is the first time they're hearing it. And so there is a skill in being able to say something that you've said a million times before in a different way every time. So tell us, tell us. So that is making sure that you are not going into default behavior. So, and this is really hard. This takes a lot of energy, but I really think that's what differentiates you from other, other salespeople and people remember you and they come back to you and they talk to your boss and tell you how great you were, which is that you are able to switch out of default response and hone in on the person that you're looking at or hone in on the person who asked you a question and re-say your response, your statement, your answer 
as a purposeful response with emotionality. And that is that is not even a very like hard skill I can give you. Like I can't be like step one, step two, step three. It's really as simple as you just cannot go into default. And unfortunately, when we're in sales positions, when we're in retail environments, we do say and do the same things over and over again. But that default is what kills your charisma. It destroys any chance you have at warmth and connection. So that's still a verbal thing though, isn't it? I don't think so. Like let's, no? I don't think so. Because like, let's say the phrase, um, welcome, how can I help you? Okay. Let's just that verbal phrase. Mm -hmm. You could say that a million different ways. For example, you can say it really bored, like, welcome, how can I help you? Okay, that's like a on the out breath. Okay, I breathed mm -hmm. out as I said it, which is like, oh, I'm tired, <laughs> my feet hurt, and I want to go home. Whereas if I were to breathe life into that statement, I could say that with way more emotionality. and you can't even see my body, which is, welcome, how can I help you? Which is, welcome, how can I help you? Right, all just even breathing emotionality into it. All I'm doing is going, don't default. Don't say this like you've said it a million times before. Oftentimes, reading someone else's micro expression or reading their body language can help snap you out of default. So one of the things that we teach in our course is the way that you stay out of default mode is you make sure that you're constantly reading someone that you're talking to. This does a couple things. First, it gives you makes you have really good eye contact because you're reading them. Uh, second, it snaps you out of default. You're taking the individual person in front of you for exactly who they are instead of stereotyping them into brunette, woman walking in here, man, you know, who, uh, father who wants to buy a car, whatever it is. You know, we, we, we lens like that. We thin slice. We can't help it. But reading someone individually for how we think they're feeling, what we think they're showing, what their feet are saying, what their hands are saying, that actually helps snap you out of that default behavior. So that's why it's, it's so great, the nonverbal side for you and for them. So on that, have you got any secrets that you can share with us on how to read people? I guess the question I'm coming from here is, I know just from personal experience, some people will come in and they do, they're happy to buy, they just do not want to be spoken to Yeah. versus the person who is kind of just coming in for a chat really Yeah. <laughs> and probably isn't going to buy anything. Is there... Apart from when you approach somebody and if they brush you off, are there any nonverbal cues when you're saying you can read people? Is there any way you can pick up on those things right from the beginning so you don't kind of embarrass yourself? Yeah. So there are definitely things. We call that speed reading, um, speed reading people. Um, there are definitely things you can look at to figure out, do they want to engage? Do they not want to engage? Like, right? How can I respect their their experience. So mm -hmm. uh, the very most basic one, there are actually 30 different patterns that kind of arrange from everything from like casual to negotiations. But one of the most basic ones is um, our toes typically point in the direction that we want to point towards the person or the most interesting thing in the room. So if you have someone mm -hmm. who comes in and they're kind of uh, moving around, they're moving their body around, but they have their toes pointed out or towards you. That usually means that their mind is engaged with you. That they kind of want to either hear your opinion or hear about a sale or hear about recommendations or have some kind of interaction with you. Whereas if you see that their point, their, your, their toes are pointed towards a certain rack or towards the back or towards the exit, that means they are very much focused on the product and the experience. So you will actually notice, and I, I challenge you over the next few days to just walk people's <laughs> feet. You will notice that people will change their feet and their position of their feet, even when they're just standing and talking to someone. At networking events specifically, you can see that people will often point their toes towards the person they're most attracted to. So I can almost always guess office crushes that way. Um, <laughs> we do this, That's amazing. Yeah, we do it without even realizing it. And so when someone walks in, they've sort of planted, right? They've planted or maybe they're walking quite slowly. Pay attention to where their feet and then their torso is oriented. Are they kind of aiming in your direction? Okay, they might want some engagement from you. They might want you to come over and talk to them and show them a couple of things. Are they pointing the exact opposite direction from you? That means they do not want to have that interaction. It's a very, very easy litmus test to be able to tell. Okay. That, wow. I'm going to, I'm just going to be like in the supermarket looking at people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what? that's the best place to practice. I think that, you know, a lot of this, luckily, you know, we have so much reality television and, um, so, so many ways to watch this body language right now. I'm watching, um, big brother Australia, uh, 2014. So last year's <laughs> season. And, um, uh, it's fascinating to watch, 
the body language on the participants and where they point their toes immediately. You can almost always guess who's in alliance with who, um, who has crushes on who. It's, it's fascinating. So practicing on TV in the supermarket, low pressure is good. <laughs> that that's imba- that just must be like your you know the the living textbook. You must just get really excited with shows like that because I know that obviously what we see in those sorts of shows is very edited. So what's coming across in the show may not be what you're actually seeing because you can kind of see the insider tips and tricks. Yeah, the the editing makes it hard. However, I try to only do things that are um, like I, I'm watching a continuous shot. So I'm not like watching cutaways. Cutaways, it's like mm-hmm. forget it. They're, they're <laughs> totally added in there. But when you're looking at like a continuous shot or you're looking at like a, for example, on like uh, The Bachelor here in the States, you can see like shots of a whole group interacting or talking and it's one continuous shot and it's great because you're able to see some really um, honest body language expressions. I just wanted to um, go back to the behaviors of shoplifters. Yeah. Give us a couple of tips on that one. Yeah. So typically, um, and this is actually, there's been research done on shoplifters because the good news is, is there's lots of videos of um, people shoplifting from in-store cameras. And so a set of researchers sat down and looked at what happens. And typically they find that um, shoplifters want to, A, take up as little space as possible, um, as if their brain is saying, I hope they don't look at me. I hope they don't notice me. I hope they don't look at me. (laughs) So you'll notice that they'll tuck their chin to their chest. They'll aim their forehead down. And they'll typically have their arms very, very tightly pinned to their sides. They usually won't cross over their chest because that looks too suspicious. But they'll have Mm -hmm. them really tightly, stiffly pinned to their sides because they're trying to take up as little space and be as less as um as little do as little noticeable behavior as possible um and then they also will typically hide their hands so they usually will have their hands in pockets behind their back um uh they'll have them hidden in a purse or in a bag and that's even before they begin the shoplift it's almost like their brain is preparing them to be able to take something and then hide it um so shoppers normal non-shoplifting shoppers you know, they are up. They have their chin up. They have their forehead up. They're doing a lot of large sweeping gazes. They're sometimes looking down at tables, but they're usually engaging in large eye movements. So they're they're much looser. They have a lot more movement. They're taking up more space. Shoplifters are typically, it's almost like they're on like a beelined path because a lot of the time ahead of, before they go into shoplift, they have a sort of walking plan in mind and they're just trying to execute it as fast and as quietly as possible. And so they're mm-hmm. not making these kind of sweeping uh, shopping eye gestures. Uh, they're on this sort of path to their to their end goal, especially if they've pre-planned it. Wow. <laughs> it's like, so now we're looking at people's feet and feet and looking at their arms and their foreheads and their chins. Yes, right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, see over the next, you know, few days and weeks, if you notice um, any particularly odd body language and watch their pattern throughout the store. See, are they, do they try anything on? Are they people who are, um, like, they're, they're, uh, they touch everything around them? Are they in and done? See if you yourself can recognize patterns because there are definitely patterns in different kinds of retail shoppers and that will help clue you in to, okay, this person high touch, she or he is touching everything in the store. Uh, okay, this person is a smiler. They smile at everyone they walk next to. Okay, this person um, clenches their purse in front of their chest. Okay, and they typically, um, they like to chit chat. Right? Are there any patterns you can see with your customers? Because that can really help as well. And I don't think that we do that. I think, I just, I just get so excited about talking to people. Clearly, I like talking. But so when people come in, I, I will genuinely notice something about them. Like I will, you know, oh, that's a beautiful dress. And I don't, I don't mean it in the, oh, hey, isn't the weather nice type of thing. I'll be like, I really like those earrings. Yeah. Or, you know, I really like that dress. It looks really great on you. And I just, that, I find that builds rapport. But if you can, like you just said, if you can start paying attention to even their movements, Perhaps you can then pick up on, you know, like the bag clutcher, comment on her bag because clearly she's seeing that as a security type yeah. thing. Yeah. So if, you, if you've acknowledged that, she may not notice herself, but you've actually seen her. You've actually interacted with her. And that is exactly how you get out of default, right? Like noticing these patterns, looking at people and trying to figure out who they are, whether that's her bag or not, 
you are disengaging that default part of your brain so that when you genuinely do say, I love your bag or how are you, how can I help you, it sounds like a, a genuine real comment as opposed to something you have to say. Yeah, and, and you should be. Like it's your you gotta be you gotta have fun when you're at work. Like you don't wanna be that person that says, My feet hurt and I really wanna go home. Like, don't you wanna be really happy and excited to be helping people? Like I know people can be complete pains in the asses, but at the end of the day, you have to enjoy being there. You're gonna be there for eight or ten hours a day. So why not take this opportunity to start picking up these cues and start keeping your brain interested in between people and, oh, yeah, that's a bag clutcher. (laughs) What's interesting is there was um, a waiter in in New York City who started a blog about being a waiter. Mm -hmm. And he made his job like basically a scientific study of people where he did exactly what we were just talking about. He looked for patterns between patrons. He um, tested different behaviors and and, uh, verbal tips to see if they got him any more responses or any more tips. And so if you can turn your experience into like your own kind of human behavior lab, not only does that engage your brain, it makes it much more fun, but also you are able to then talk about your work later whether that's on your resume or 10 years from now to say, you know, when I worked in retail, I felt like I got to study people in depth and notice patterns about people. And that's, that's on the, on the flip side, that makes you incredibly memorable even outside your job. I was going to say, if somebody had said that to me in an interview, I'd be like, oh yeah, I want that person. (laughs) Of course. Oh my gosh. Of course. To be like, you know, I noticed in our old, our old store that, um, people who came in and, um, did a big sweep of the store, typically they were more interested in the sale items where I noticed people who went right to the front, uh, the front desk with the accessories, they were more interested in hearing about, um, our latest items. I mean, that, those kind of patterns are, are so valuable to future bosses as well as current bosses. And, and, to, and to yourself, like keeping you interested in, in what you're doing every day. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I'm very mindful of the time. So I just wanted to ask, do you have a top tip for closing the deal with our body language? Top tip. Um, I would say that it is about, and this is a hard one, but I think it's about matching the person's energy. And when I say energy, I don't mean something frou-frou. I mean uh, their pace, their cadence, their body language. The best salespeople that can close the deal are doing it on the other person's terms. So the perfect example of this is I walked into um, into a store uh, at 7-Eleven. It was really early in the morning. We were on our way to the airport. And uh, the guy behind the counter was like, hello, good morning, welcome. <laughs> and I was like half asleep you know, I was barely even thinking straight. And his energy was great, don't get me wrong, but it was so opposite the context in my own that I just wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. I was, was, instead of like, we had a little bit of time before the taxi came, instead of walking around and actually like, you know, maybe buying some snacks. I was like, water out. Like, <laughs> um, you so, just have way too energy for this time yeah, of the morning. Yeah, too much. And, and I think that was because it's, it was a mismatch, right? I felt like he was on a totally different level than I was. So what I would say is, is if you have someone who's um, really bubbly and excited and extroverted and that feels like you, that could be natural to you, you know, maybe raise your energy a few notches. Um, match their speed of, of the way that they speak. Match their, their pitch and their tone. Um, match them on their ener- energetic level. Level. If you have someone who's a little bit more demure, a little bit more introverted, you talking at them in a loud volume is going to make them very uncomfortable. So matching their volume, maybe slowing down your pace to match their pace, um, you know, using their space, the space that they're using, if they like to stand a little bit further away from you, making sure that you're not closing that gap. The more you can match them, the more comfortable that they're going to be and the more relatable you are going to be to them. Fantastic. So my last question that I, I try and ask everybody is, what makes you go wow when you walk into a store? Um, probably uh, salespeople who get me. And that's very similar to the thing that I just said. But I'm mm-hmm. always just amazed. My favorite stores that I go to over and over again, um, it they seem to just pick up on – I don't know if they're looking at my feet or not. <laughs> they just pick up on when – to talk and engage and show me something and when to let me sort of ponder in my own head when I'm trying to figure something out. And I know exactly the salespeople and the stores uh, that have done that for me. And that is just, it's like feeling heard. It's incredible. 
Thank you so much for today. Uh, we can find you at scienceofpeople.com and I've been over there. There's a great little um, section where you can play and I did the 15 minutes worth of uh, video Yay! So. <laughs> cool. Thank you. It was great. Um, I, I have so much more that I would love to talk to you about, but but we but time's of the essence here. So I would love to have you back on again soon. And is there anything else we need to know about Vanessa Van Edwards or Science of People? Um, no, we just we give all of our stuff away for free. We have a, a whole course on increasing your charisma and your influence, and that's all free because I just believe that everyone should be able to increase their influence in a way that they want. So, uh, if you'd love to take our little video mini course, you're welcome to it, and all of our all of our articles and videos. I hope they help. Oh, that is so generous. I'll pop the links up to the website, up to your website on our website. And thank you so much again. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.